going to be discussing basic haircuts today. And y'all have already had a little experience, so you know what we're talking about. But I want to start with the basic tools we use. And I want to show you how to palm them, because I've had some students to tell me lately they don't know how to palm them. And that's one thing you're going to have to do at State Board. We know how to hold our scissors. Ring finger. Rest. When we start to section off, we don't lay our scissors or our comb down. We palm them. And scissors are simply palmed by taking our thumb out. And now we've got our comb and we section. Make sure you palm because these scissors are tight enough. If you leave your hand in it and as you're parting, they're going to come open. And what's going to happen when they go through your hair? It's going to slice it out. Some of y'all have already had that happen, haven't you? <laughs> That's why we palm. It's a safety precaution also to keep from moving around and poking somebody with them. Our, our razor, you should be able to, and, and I always tell my students, cut your client, not yourself, because you should be able to see the blade on the back side of your razor. On the front side, it's not visible. So a left-handed person would want to take the guard off and put it on on the other direction. Well, mine don't want to slip on for that. I must have a, a right-handed one. But anyway, when you see that blade, it shouldn't be facing you. That's how you get cut. It's by seeing the blade. Can you tell the difference in what I'm talking about? There's several ways to hold the razor. New students usually like to put their thumb here and grasp that handle because it gives you a secure feeling, and that's perfectly all right. You'll notice other people, more advanced, will raise their handle up, and you've got a finger rest there. Put the thumb there, your ring finger on that rest, and prop your little finger there and cut. Some people will also put three fingers up here, and that gives you a little more secure feeling. But it becomes top-heavy when you do this, and if you feel uncomfortable with that, don't do it. Hold on to it. But when you're cutting with your razor and you need to section some more hair and let it down, palm your razor, and your razor is palmed by closing it, and that's how it should look. Hold on to it. This razor is not going to hurt you um, as long as you've got the guard on right. Even if we come down and cut like this, you can see space between my finger and that. If it's turned wrong and you get a little bit to the side of your finger, it's going to slice it. And I have students always tell me that I'm scared to death of the razor. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I couldn't tell you the hundreds of times I have cut myself with my shears. And I've only cut myself with a razor one time. And that was a very stupid thing I did. So I want to tell you, although these razor blades are sharp and they'll cut most anything, they are not to be used to snip your perm bottle tops because that's how I cut myself really badly. I decided I couldn't find the scissors that you snip off the perm bottle top with, so I took my guard off. I knew this blade would cut through that plastic. And it did. It cut the top off good. It cut all the way through my cuticle. It cost me almost a week of work for one stupid move. Because I'd worked with this razor long enough, I knew that that wasn't the thing to do. So don't be frightened of your razor that it's going to cut you. It's going to only cut you if you allow it to, or if you put yourself in a position for it to cut you. The scissors, as long as you don't cut above this second knuckle, you won't cut yourself unless you just get your finger caught here or somewhere you're cutting cl close to your fingers. But when you hold hair above that second knuckle, you do not have as much strength there as you do down here. And also you're getting your shears too close to your fingers and you're going to nip right through there all the time. Some of y'all already pinched yourselves or cut yourself with them. All right, now that we've talked about our implements a little bit, we're going to talk about how we do our haircuts. And there's several things we got to consider. And one of them is the shape of the head. And we very seldom think about the shape of the head until somebody walks in the room that has had all of their hair cut off. 
and you can see the shape really, really well. We have crowns that stick up higher. We have the crowns back here that are flat and we can hardly see where the occipital bone is. And even though we don't see that ordinarily, even if we're not going to take all the hair off, we've got to consider that head form. Why? The way the hair's going to hang? And the way it, the hair is going to stick up in certain places. If we've got a high area, the hair is going to stick up a little more there or appear to be more voluminous. So we want to understand the shape of the head or skull or the head form because it does play a major role in our hair cutting. We also want to understand our reference points. And one of those y'all learned in first quarter. What was that reference point? And I told you to always remember that one. The occipital. Because that's where a lot of our haircuts begin and end and as we were going through the book while ago and we're going to see them again we start and end some haircuts at the occipital bone that one y'all called the mushroom while ago it was cut real close up to the occipital and then what happened they brought the hair back down and got a guideline at the occipital right so we all know where the occipital is another one is the parietal ridge what is the parietal ridge or where is it located Right up here, and we can find it by placing the comb side of the head and where it leaves the head. It's a parietal ridge. Why are we interested in that in hair cutting? Is that where we may begin to get longer or shorter with certain hairstyles? Mm -hmm. Right. What's the apex then? It's the highest point, so it may not necessarily be right dead center on the top the four corners and why what kind of reference do we need corners of the head for they're found like this for bangs because where do bangs start at the two front corners all right so we understand our reference points now reference points are points on the head that mark where the surface of the head changes so mine's not going to be the same as yours, is it? We can't always say go three inches above the ears and start cutting. You've got the parietal ridge. Some people's may be two inches. Some may be four inches. So it's important then we can do it real simply and find out where they are. The client doesn't even have to know what we're doing. We also want to understand the areas of the head. And these, you know, sometimes we go out there and tell a client, say, your nape area you know, the growth pattern changes, and where is the nape area? They don't have a clue, but we need to learn where they are so we can educate our client, and so we'll know where we're working and what uh, back to the shape again. The top is by locating our parietal ridge. You can identify which hair grows on the top of the head. The hair here lies on the head. We know in our mannequins the follicles shoot straight up, so it wants to stand straight up. But on our head, it takes a direction somewhere, and it's going to lay down flat, unless we do have that cow lick or swirl. The front is found by making a parting or drawing a line from the apex to the back of the ear. Then separate the hair that falls naturally in front of the ear from the hair that falls naturally behind the ear. So everything in front of the ear is considered the front. Then we have the sides and the crown area. The crown is the area between the apex and the back of the parietal ridge. And our nape area. We were doing permanent waves. Do y'all remember me coming back and telling you that in the nape area you should have like three or four rods down? Why did I only want three or four rods down? That's about the size of the nape region. We have the back of the head, and that would be right through here, and the fringe area. And it amazes me to watch people cut the fringe area. Have y'all noticed that since we've got into hair cutting, some people cut the fringe area by coming from a V here and coming down to the four corners. Some section it off a box. And for different hairstyles, we might do that. That's why we need to know where the apex is, the four corners are, and where the fringe area is. They've used a triangle here. Then we want to understand lines and angles. And we've been talking about lines a lot as we got into hair cutting. We got our guide line. 
and then I'll say, I don't want to see any more lines in your haircut. Why don't I want other lines in your basic haircut that you start? Because it's not blended. You've, you've been cutting horizontally. If I see a line in it, I know you've cut horizontally rather than cutting vertically like you were instructed to. Is there haircuts we want to see lines in? Right. We saw a lot of them a while ago. There is some time we want a line there, but we don't want to see a line unless it's in that distinctive haircut. We've got it cl cut close here. Then the mushroom, look, we want to see another line. We see a line here. We see a line here. Sometimes we're going to even see lines here as we see it angle down. So every haircut is made up of lines and angles. A line is a thin, continuous mark used as a guide. An angle is the space between two lines or surfaces that intersect at a given point. And we've been doing this over and over as we do in permanent waves or whatever. What is a horizontal line? It runs with the flow or with the horizon. What then is a vertical line? Straight up and down. Now a diagonal line. It's in between the two. We got horizontal, vertical, diagonal just falls between the two. And every one of them has a place in our hair cutting at some point in time. Diagonal lines are located between horizontal and vertical. They have a slanting or sloping direction. Diagonal lines are used to create beveling, a technique for creating fullness in a haircut by cutting the ends of the hair at a slight taper. Y'all made mention of it a while ago. Why did you cut that shorter around the front? Because you kind of thought it was a blunt cut. But a closer inspection, we saw that this hair up here was only this long. And yet the haircut itself was this long. Now something I want to take a lot of time on, and I want to tell you why we section, and this is the same reason we sectioned in permanent waves, and what is that? Get the to get the angles right. What else? Right, so you are working in sections at a time. Does it not also give us a working plan that we start here and we should wind up there? And if we don't do that, what might we do? Cut here a little while and cut here a little while and come over here and cut a little while. And then when we bring it all together, what might we have? A mess. Because we didn't follow any working plan. So we want to always make sure that our sections are not only a section, but they're uniform. We want that part down the center. And when we let down this much at the nape area on this side, we want to make sure we let down that much on the other side. If we go to put an angle here, then our elevation is going to be wrong. And that's what we're going into now is elevation. And learning elevation is how you learn to take these pictures that clients bring in and cut a haircut. And elevation is how you hold the hair in relation to the guide you first cut. That first guide you cut is determined by how long or how short you want that hair to be in that area. So we've got a guide. We've cut it. We let down the next section. How do we know how to elevate for that next section? Right, depending on if we want a blunt cut, at which point we're going to ha have zero elevation. We're going to bring it right to that guide and cut it. If she wants a basic layered haircut, which is what I'm wanting out of you at this point, we're going to hold it up just a little. Not going to be zero elevation. 45 degrees. 45 degrees. But a lot of people call this the 95 degree, I mean, excuse me, the 90 degree haircut. High elevation is called. So I, I kind of stay away from the degrees because different people have different theories and where they're measuring from also for an angle. To get every hair on the head the same length at the end of a basic layered haircut should be straight down at the nape area, straight out right above the occipital, straight up on the crown and top. And this shows you how your elevations would go. And if you will hold it like that, 
And we talked about our guideline a while ago. And what we use in a basic layered haircut is a traveling guide. And that means we cut this guide, we use it to cut this. Once this is cut, we use it as the guide and cut this. And once this is cut, we use it as the guide and it moves right on up with us. We don't worry about bringing hair back down to here because this hair simply would not be long enough to bring back to a stationary guideline. A stationary guideline, on the other hand, is one that you bring all the hair to. And we saw some haircuts a while ago of where that would be the case, that it all comes back to that one guideline. Would that have a stationary guideline? It would until we got to the bangs or the fringe area, and then we just do that entirely again. So we want to remember about our guidelines. So the higher we hold the hair in relation to our guide, the more hair we will cut off. So if we wanted a haircut where we've got some length here and we wanted it shorter through here, then we would hold it higher and cut more hair. If we wanted it to not be as layered, we would hold it lower in relation. And I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here with the mannequin. And I think I showed you this a while ago, but we can never see elevation too much. In a basic layered haircut, this is held straight up. And that appears to be straight. Right? But if I wanted to cut more off the front and have this a little shorter than the basic, all I'd have to do is bring it over further. And you can see how much hair I would remove. That would make it decidedly shorter. Right? right. If I had not wanted... Or let's assume I wanted this a lot longer. When I cut with my guide back here, I would have brought it this way. And you can see, oh me, I've cut too much off now. You understand what I'm saying? So it's all in relation to that guide. It's going to move with your guide. I don't know if, uh, since I didn't demonstrate your cut, and I'm not sure, but she probably did. This is a ruler. And if you'll notice on there, we can always measure to see where we're headed. Seven inches long. We have a private joke, I see. None of us knew that was a ruler. And uh, so later on in the haircut, she started holding the palms of the hair. Right. She kept saying, measure it. And we're going, where's the ruler? <laughs> <laughs> You've got it in your hand. So you want to always remember, if you've started back there with seven inches, you can measure periodically as you go along and see what you've got. And the inches are on there. I know they're difficult to see. But you can always measure. And that's one way when you're wanting it to all be one length to go along. But again, that goes back to elevation. What is a cutting line then? Uh, the angle at which the fingers are held when cutting. The angle at which the fingers are held while cutting. All right, now that's always a tricky one because I always get all these questions. Can I hold my fingers like this? Can I hold my fingers like that? Can I hold them like this? But that's not what they're talking about in the cutting line. So let's take a small piece here because I don't want to get over my middle finger. If I were to hold them like that, I would cut straight off. Right? But let's assume I held my fingers like that. What's going to happen there? I'm going to cut it at an angle. And let's assume I grabbed it up like that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be another angle. And either one of those angles is going to create something different than the other. Because this time I'm going like this. A while ago I was going like this. One's going to leave the front of my hair shorter. One's going to leave the back of it. So we've got to be real careful about our cutting lines. It's not so typical in the top to have a problem, but in the back a lot of times when we get to doing this, we want to do this, or we do that and bring it up. And where we stand creates a problem too, because if I'm cutting here and I'm standing over here, I want to pull it to me. So I want to move every time I move to a different section of the head, I'm going to take a step because I want my body right even with what I'm cutting. So our cutting line is the angle at which the fingers are held. What is a guideline? The length at which you want it all cut the, to. The, line cut. 
the first line you cut. And that would be whether you're talking about a stationary or a traveling, right? It's the first line you cut. Sometimes we call it a guide. It's simply a section of hair that determines the length the hair will be cut. It can be on the perimeter, and the perimeter is the outer edges, or it can be on the internal part or the inside of the head. And we've started with perimeter because that's where we want you to stay. It's easier to cut from the perimeter to the inside than from the inside to the perimeter. So we know now what our stationary guideline is and what our traveling guideline is. We want to talk about direction that the hair is held. And one of the first things we want to talk about, and you heard this when we was in um, roller sets, over direction and under direction. And what happens when I over direct? It's going to make it shorter. That's right, when I over-direct. Because when I take this, and we know that this mannequin's all cut to one length, when I take this and over-direct, I'm going to cut off a lot more hair. It's going to make this shorter in the front. What then happens when, if I were to under-direct? It's going to leave hair longer. Is there times we might do that in the middle of a haircut? Yes. A while ago we looked at those and they pulled all the guides straight up and then cut it. And this hair come from here, but this hair only come from here, so it's going to leave the very top a lot shorter than it was out here. So there is a time for over-direction. Let's talk about our client consultation for a moment because this is where the greater problems, all of y'all are worried that you're going to mess up the haircut. But the haircut oftentimes is messed up from the time we talk with the client. And why is that? We don't get a clear view of what? Of what the client wants. And why is that? They don't understand what the cut is. Could it be that we don't listen well enough? Could it be that we didn't have the pictures? Could be. That's right, reflective listening. We can, we can expect her to come in with a picture sometime. She's going to do that. Is that picture going to show the back, the front, and both sides? No, it's not. So we've got to be real careful with our conversation with her and that we understand. I'll, usually it's going to be a frontal view of a hairstyle. That's what we're going to see. And we've got to wing what the back of it's going to be. So it's best to be questioning her or to get our book out or to get some books with styles similar to that and say... Um, Is this how the back of it looks? Is this how you want the back of it to look? That, a picture is worth a thousand words, let me tell you. She's brought you something in and the top you know is like this, although it's styled nothing like this. But you can't see the back exactly. You wonder if she wants it that short or does she want it a little bit longer. So we know that the consultation, we'll lay it on her and say she didn't explain it to us well enough. But we should have had her explain it well enough. That's our fault if the communication's down. Who is the professional in this consultation? You are, and you make sure. Another thing that happens is a client sees a movie star, or goes through one of these movie magazines, and there's this gorgeous woman, and her hair is kind of the same color, so she thinks if she gets this style that she'll look just like her. And she comes in to you with it. And this is during the consultation. And it is a beautiful hairstyle. And your client's not an ugly woman either. She's right pretty. But her face is rounder than that movie star's. Or her face is more narrow. Let's assume it's more narrow and this hairstyle is really flat here. What's that going to do to her make face? It it's going to make it look about that long and about that wide. So what we've got to do, and she doesn't know to look at her facial shape, and she doesn't know if she brings it in real close, it's going to make it look longer. That's where you're the trained professional. And you can't come out and say, well, your face is too long for that. 
You know, we got to handle it a little better than that. We again have our style books, and we say, I think that would really look good on you. But I would like to see you with some puffiness at the sides. That'll build your cheekbones up. Your cheekbones are really pretty, but I think the way you wear your rouge or blush is. But I'd like to see this fullness here. Let's try it with that. We can always bring it in a little flatter. And she may or may not accept your suggestion. And if she doesn't and she wants it cut the other way, then well and good, give it to her. You know, because she's not going to be satisfied without it. And she's going to figure out what it looked like and that you tried to lead her in the right direction. But all of these things need to take place during the consultation. Next thing you need to do during the consultation is to do an analysis of her hair. All hair will not do the same cut. I'm sorry to tell you, it just will not. Sometimes it's, and we always have a tendency to think it's because it's too fine or too thin. It won't do that. But oftentimes it's where it's too thick. It won't lay that way because it's too thick and it's too coarse and it wants to just blouse out everywhere. So the first thing we want to know is the density. What is the density of the hair? The number of individual hair strands. That's right. How many hair strands per square inch? What is the texture? Fine, coarse, or medium. What about the wave pattern? Right. Straight, wavy, curly. Curly hair cuts a lot more different than straight hair. Hair lines. What's in that cow what's in that hairline? Is there a cowlick? Is there a widow's peak? You know, do we have a real pretty hairline or do we have parts of the hairline that needs to be covered up? We've got some baldness right through here. She may be going to need something to cover that up. What about the growth pattern? What direction it grows in? Where is that natural part? And to find this, and everybody has a natural part. To find that, we want to make sure the hair is wet. We've combed it flat back all the way back. Put our hand here and wiggle it just a little bit. And that hair will fall in a natural part. And the reason that natural part is where it's at, it's wherever it falls, from here to here, this hair grows in a downward slope. From here to here, it grows on this side. Some people's be in the middle. Some people's will be at a diagonal. But everybody has one of them, and that's your growth pattern. And we're fighting a losing battle to fight the growth pattern. If that natural part's right here and it's diagonal and she wants to put a center part, she's going to fight that battle every day. This is going to poof up more. It's going to flop back over here eventually. She's going to fight it all day trying to get it there. So try to talk them into using their growth patterns. Let's talk about some rules of thumb, but they are not chiseled in stone which means that that's not every client that comes in here is going to fall into one of these categories. We have them everywhere in between. If hair texture is fine and thin, it's length and needs some weight. If it's fine and medium density, it can carry off a lot of different cuts. Works well especially for blunt and low elevation. Razor cuts are good with this type of hair. If it's fine and thick, it usually needs more texturizing. It's suitable for many haircuts. What do we mean when we're talking about texturizing? Thinning it out. We used to call texturizing thinning, believe it or not. Point cutting. And that's where instead of cutting like this, we take and cut into the ends. So it makes an uneven edge. We have medium texture hair that is thin. It needs some weight, so graduated shapes work well with it. If it's medium texture and medium density, it's great for most cuts. It handles texturizing well, too. Not all hair can be texturized. Medium texture hair with thick density, many shapes are suitable, but you must texturize in order to get it to go into the style we want it to be in. If it's coarse texture hair and it's thin, it can maintain some weight. We remember now what a weight line is. That's where a lot of hair falls to the same place. If it's coarse hair and medium density, it's great for many shapes. Razor cuts are appropriate if hair is in good condition. 
If his cord ha coarse hair with thick density, very short cuts do not work. Why do short cuts not work? It, it, they're all spikes, no matter what the person wants it to do. If we cut that coarse, thick hair really short, it's going to spike up regardless. It'll look like a box top or a flat top. Razors may frizz and expand this type of hair. Maintain some length to weigh the hair down because this is the type of hair that wants to blow out on us and look real big and voluminous. All right, we've talked about our tools and our body positions and some of our safety precautions to make sure we don't get cut and we don't cut our clients either. But we want to talk about some safety in haircutting, and safety has a place in every unit we do. We talked about our shears and our razor and palming them. And we said we'd done that because we didn't want to slice some of the hair out. But what else can get sliced while we're slicing around? We fingers. fingers. Right. And if we're working around down here, what else? Anything. Anything. So we want to make sure we learn to palm our implements and that we do so during a cut. Make sure we don't cut past the second knuckle. We want to make sure we're careful in the ears because we can easily nip an ear. We also want to make sure when we're cutting fringe or the bang area that we've got a hand between what? Their eyes. Their eyes. We want to make sure we're not digging around up here without the other hand up there because clients move and then there goes the shears in their eyes. When working with razor, always use a guard. And I got the funniest question at the state board meeting I went to last Tuesday. One of the instructors there, and us cosmetology instructors are usually a very brilliant crew when we get together. The state board said, if we find a candidate using a razor in an unsafe manner, we're going to make them quit using the razor. And quit with the haircut at that point. And one of the instructors up and asked, well, what about if they're using a razor with no guard on? What are you going to do about it? Well, now to me, if I'm up here swinging this around in a haircut, I would relatively call that a, a, a unsafe manner. Because the only time you would use a razor like this, and, and I was trained with a razor, I'll go ahead and tell you, we, you didn't do scissor cuts. We cleaned up the neckline with a razor. We did not do it with clippers. And we did not have a guard on it when we cleaned up the neckline. We were not taught to shave faces because cosmetologists do not shave faces. However, we learned how because a lot of men still got their faces shaved whenever they do that. And we done it with a straight razor because that's actually what that is now is a straight razor when you got the guard on. But their answer, state board's answer, really surprised me because they said, well, as long as they're not using it in an unsafe manner, it'll be okay. I don't know if they didn't understand the question or what. When you got your guard off and you're swinging that around or cutting with it, to me that's, that's unsafe. All right, so be real careful with your razor and keep your guard on. Take extra care when removing and disposing of the razor blade. We have a sharps box back there, and that's where I want you to place it because I don't want our custodian to come in and pick up our trash and grab the bag and wind up with a razor blade in her hand. All right. Can we take a little break? Yeah.